Good afternoon. Really nice to see you. Those of you I can't see. Um, I'm Gordela Weiss Sussex. I'm reader in German and uh, acting director of the IMLR. Um, and yeah, very, very warm welcome from me to, uh, to the Nash lecture. Um, it's, it's of course all very, very different this year, but like every year, this is a really nice opportunity for us to celebrate what's going on in the postgraduate community and uh, uh, you know the, the, the research that's going on. It's so diverse and so you know so important as well. Um, and we see that every year when the uh, when the proposals come in, and uh, you know the interest is is just really cheering to see how many of you are, are joining in and. Um, uh, and you know, proposing things. And wouldn't it be nice to have a like Nash lecture every month so we could really do justice um, to all the proposals? Well, anyway, we can't. And um, so I'm I'm very very pleased to uh, give a special welcome to Catherine today, Catherine Calvert, who is our lecturer today. Uh, and congratulations, Catherine. Uh, and. Um, so Catherine is in her final year uh, of her PhD at the University of Sheffield um, and uh, under the supervision of Sean Williams and Caroline Bland. She's writing on the subject of motherhood in the Weimar Republic. And I think that's a brilliant topic because I think there are so many, you know, so many aspects of this topic where we think, oh, we know this, we know this, but you know, there is a lot, a lot of sort of unknowing to be done and a lot of um, rethinking. So great topic. Um, and uh, I very much look forward to, uh, to your talk. So just for the, uh, the way we're doing things, uh, just to say briefly, the lecture is going to be recorded. Uh, and um, I think for the Q&A afterwards, the most sensible thing to do is to if you could like, uh, write a quick line in the chat, either ask your question in the chat or just say, I want to ask a question, because I can keep an eye on the chat, but I can't keep an eye on, on all the raised hands. So let's, let's, let's go via the chat. Um, uh, during the lecture, if everyone could keep muted, that's, that would help. Um, and I think that's all. So off we go. Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm really excited that this is happening now after we had to delay a couple of times because of everything that's going on this year. So um, yeah, I'm really pleased that this is happening today. Um, yeah, so my lecture is titled The Idealised Mother and the Socialist Movement in Weimar, Germany. Um, so whether, when and how women mother is political, Women's reproductive and mothering choices and the way that these choices are perceived socially impact substantially on women's experiences. All aspects of women's personal and private reproductive choices seem to be open to public scrutiny. Media outlets or anonymous social media users feel entitled to criticize mothers if they're too young or too old um, for bottle feeding or for breastfeeding in public, uh, for returning to work too soon or for not returning to work at all. Um, so personal reproductive decisions made by women are the subject of fierce ideological debates and the politicization of women's mothering only becomes more pronounced at times of national crisis. The Weimar Republic was founded at such a time of national crisis in the wake of the First World War. Against the backdrop of Germany's defeat and the ensuing revolutions, Maternalist perspectives prevailed as women's perceived natural caring capacities were called upon to help heal the nation. Maternalist policies were widely supported across the political spectrum and within the women's movements. For example, Maria Yukach, who became leader of the Social Democratic Women's Movement in 1917, founded the Arbeiter Wolfart, which focused on providing welfare support for women and children. Renata Poor notes that with the creation of a new organization, women could be politically active and useful without challenging the power of men. Indeed, under UCAC's leadership, the social democratic women's movement largely maintained gendered spheres. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen there. There we go. Um, so UCAC was the first woman to speak in the Weimar National Assembly and she used her speech to reassure both other deputies and the general public 
that um, we, dear, zu Frauen, wir werden aber niemals unsere Frauentum verleugnen. UCASH outlines specific policy areas on which women should focus, such as infant and child welfare and social policies. This represented a continuation of the charitable social welfare work performed by feminists in the pre-World War I period and restricted women's political ambitions to areas in which their participation was already established. Despite many continuations in women's pre- and post-World War I position, the Weimar era did offer new rights and opportunities for women. Um, so in addition to the right to vote and to stand for election, um, the Weimar um, era also offered women greater access to public space. So um, symbolic of women's increasing opportunities was the new woman. Um, she was typically employed in white collar work. She supported modern fashion trends such as cropped hair. Um, and she became a model for the ideals of femininity that young women sought to emulate. While she was celebrated by some as a reflection of progress, others decried her rejection of her duty as a woman. Um, she was typically young, unmarried and childless. The relative prosperity and social modernization of the so-called golden twenties, which enabled the emergence of the new woman, gave way to renewed national crisis in the closing years of the Weimar period. Severe economic depression and the rise of the political far right hailed the open return to prominence of conservative gender ideals, although, as we shall see, these convictions had never entirely gone away. The familiar Kinder Küche Kirche slogan reflects traditional ideals about women's familial role and deeply misogynistic policies introduced during the Third Reich sought to remove women from the public sphere. So the Weimar period was defined by political and economic instability and by tensions and contradictions between persisting social conservatism and attempts at social modernization. Left-wing movements were not immune from such tensions and the German Social Democratic Party, the SPD, was as strongly critical of the Communist Party, the KPD, as it was of the fascist National Socialists. The Weimar women's movements were equally partisan with separate SPD, KPD, bourgeois and radical strands which failed to cooperate substantially with each other. As an example, Atina Grossman cites the failure to organize a coordinated leadership as the cause of the loss of momentum in the 1931 campaign against the criminalization of abortion. The rapid social changes which occurred during the Weimar period have attracted a substantial amount of critical attention. Um, for example, studies have examined extensively the role of the new woman um, and debated the extent to which she really existed or was actually just a construct of popular culture. Furthermore, the impacts of the First World War on gender relations in German society have raised discussion about the idea of the surplus woman, an inflamed debate centered on paragraph 218 of the Weimar Penal Code, which outlawed abortion in almost all cases. However, relatively little scholarly attention has been devoted to uncovering how these discussions influence the reproductive attitudes of women of childbearing age, or how women of this generation responded to and engaged with the debates. In this lecture, um, I'm focusing on the social democratic movement's approach to question of women's mothering during the Weimar era. This topic's emerged from my doctoral research, which explores cultural representations of motherhood in popular and political fiction and non-fiction women's writing from the Weimar period to shed new light on how women were grappling with the debates around their reproductive rights, duties, and choices. Um, so a valuable primary source for gaining insight into the perspectives of left-wing women in the Weimar era is Frauenwelt, the fortnightly women's magazine of the SPD, which was published between 1924 and 1933. This magazine was aimed at and largely written by social democratic women who'd come of age in the early 20th century and were therefore likely to be personally invested in questions of women's mothering and reproductive choices. Renata Poor notes that the aims of Frauenwelt was to make socialist ideals appealing to women which the magazine sought to do by mixing uh, politics with pictures, short stories, sewing patterns, fashion advice, and articles about childcare or work. 
It wasn't well received, though. Politically active women within the party found it to be superficial, and the magazine was founded on a patronising conception of women's ability or desire to engage with politics. Tony Zender, who became editor of the magazine in 1928, demonstrates this view in her autobiography. Um, so she writes, there are many hardworking housewives who dislike the daily newspapers. They're not familiar with politics, nor very much interested. We felt, however, that they would read a publication dealing with their daily problems, especially if such a magazine had an attractive artistic appearance. As editor, Zender made a number of changes to modernize the magazine, um, such as moving from fracture script to Latin typeface, and she claims that circulation began to improve. In addition to her journalistic work, Tony Zender was an active trade unionist and politician who'd been elected to the Reichstag in 1919 as part of the first cohort of women representatives. She identified with the left wing of parliamentary socialism, having originally been elected as a deputy of the short-lived independent Social Democratic Party, the USPD. Sender's political work centered on economic and foreign policy, rather than areas typically designated as women's issues. Her acceptance of the editorship of Frauenwelt is therefore somewhat of an anomaly on her CV. She observes in her autobiography that women, and this is a quote, must make a greater effort, must show more efficiency than a man in order to be recognized as an equal. Um, and she strongly advocated women's political participation, but her priority remained the advancement of the socialist movement as a whole, rather than a particular focus on women's rights. Um, as an official organ of the SPD, Kauenbelt presented itself as an authority on modern socialist mothering practices. Studying the magazine reveals the tensions and contradictions present in the social democratic movement's approach to motherhood during the Weimar era. In the following, um, we'll examine these tensions between socially progressive radical policies and the reliance on conservative ideas and theories of gender. Um, We'll look at some examples, some representative views and trends as they appeared in Frauenwelt. Um, and the examples are taken from my sample of over 100 articles about motherhood taken from the entire publication period of the magazine. Um, as an SPD sponsored publication, Frauenwelt promoted a number of more radical social policies. And I'd like to highlight two particular areas in which it advocated improvements to women's reproductive rights and the protection of mothers. First, women's access to birth control and abortion. And second, the legal rights of single mothers and their children. Yet, as we'll see, even while supporting these more radical policies, the notion of gender difference and idealization of women's mothering remains present in these discussions, revealing how deeply ingrained such ideas were during the Weimar period. Um, so during the Weimar era, abortion was illegal unless there were strong medical grounds certified by a doctor. However, in practice, the termination of pregnancies was widespread. Estimate that the number of abortions in Germany in 1931 are over 1 million. Illegal abortions could, in some cases, be obtained from licensed doctors, but at a cost that was prohibitively high for many women. For those without financial means, options for terminating a pregnancy were unsanitary or unsafe. They involved visiting licensed, back, unlicensed backstreet providers, um, again at a cost, um, albeit less than a licensed doctor, or attempting an abortion at home. The socialist movement supported the abolition of paragraph 218 of the Weimar Penal Code. They argued that unnecessary injury and death could be avoided by ending unsafe amateur abortion. However, the arguments in favor of legalizing abortion were not based on women's rights to make their own reproductive choices, but rather on economic circumstances. They take as read women's desire to mother and criticize the financial hardship which prevents women from being able to mother as they would like. For example, a 1924 article by Hildegard Wegscheider entitled Kindertrainen Mütertrainen um, appeals to the Frauen readership to vote for the SPD in the upcoming elections by highlighting the barriers to women's motherhood. 
Peg Scheider positions the SPD as the party to change the circumstances that lead women to seek to terminate their pregnancies, such as the ongoing poverty after the end of the First World War. It is expected in this article that women will identify strongly with their maternal role and the offering policies which will reduce the need for women to seek abortions will appeal. The assumption of women's desire to mother continues throughout the Weimar period and can also be found in later articles, for example, Susie Bork's 1931 article, uh, Paragraph 218 Geburtenregelung. Bork argues, es muss einen der Glaube besielen, dass nur größte Not die Frau zur Abtreibung bewegen kann, dass die Mutter Sehnsucht der Frau zu groß ist, dass sie sich stets der Größe ihrer Aufgaben zur Erhaltung des Volkes beizutragen, bewusst bleibt. Thus, we see the continued acceptance of the idea of maternal instinct and indeed duty. Bork suggests that women seek to terminate pregnancies due to financial hardship, and she doesn't entertain the notion that some women may simply choose not to become mothers. While the socialist movement supported greater rights for women over their bodies, they did so with the continued assumption of women's inherent desire to mother. In addition to these more political discussions, Frauenwelt published a number of articles that offered practical advice for women seeking to avoid unplanned pregnancies. Bork, for example, outlines and recommends a number of contraceptive options for women to reduce the need for abortions. She also appeals to women to share their experiences in order to improve collaboratively the information and advice given to women. Bork thus suggests practical measures to improve women's access to contraceptive information. Such articles offering practical advice increased in frequency during the economic crisis of the late, late Weimar period, which reflects the socialist perspective that women are more likely to seek to avoid pregnancy on financial grounds. For example, Verhutung und Erwünschte Fruchtbarkeit, attributed to a Dr. R. K., was published in September 1929, an Einiges über Schwangerschaftsverhütung by social reformer Dr. Julius Moses appeared in February 1933. Both articles contain practical information about available sources of contraception and recommendations about the most reliable form or combination of forms to try. Despite remaining wedded to the idea of women's maternal instinct, Frauenwelt does advocate greater control over women's choices about the number of children they have. Um, and in line with the somewhat patronizing principle on which the magazine was founded, attempts to educate women about the advantages of birth control. In a 1927 article, simply entitled Geburtenregelung, Hedwig Schwarz seeks to persuade women of the value of contraception. She writes, Die Frauen sollten stets bedenken, dass die Ausgabe für die Verhütung ganz minimal ist im Vergleich zu den Kosten der Aufzucht einer großen Kinderzahl bzw den Kosten diverser Abtreibungen und deren Folgen. Again, however, the discussion is framed in economic terms, underlining the assumption that it is um, financial considerations that make women want to reject motherhood. Um, in addition to advocating access to birth control and abortion, Fraunfeld also expressed support for developments in the rights of single mothers and their illegitimate children. Following the pattern of offering practical advice, many articles in support of unmarried mothers explicitly outline the law, uh, thus educating women and encouraging them to take advantages of the protections to which they are already entitled. Indeed, the constitutional guarantee of protection for mothers and children is quoted repeatedly in articles addressing the topic, um, including, for example, Lotte Müller's 1926, Die Not der unehelichen Mutter, and Adele Schreiber's 1927, Die unehelichen Mutter und ihr Kind. These articles emphasize that progress has been made in improving the status and legal rights of single mothers, and take credit on behalf of the social democratic movement for pushing these changes. However, despite praising the progress, Frauenwelt makes clear that insufficient tangible improvements have been made. Frauenwelt's writers underline particularly the ingrained prejudices in society, which contribute to the continued disadvantages faced by single mothers and their children. 
Muller, for example, complains that outdated attitudes have been held onto despite the social progress associated with the Weimar era. She writes, Wir leben in einer neuen Zeit, doch gar zu viele Menschen haben aus der alten Zeit ihre alte Anschauung in die neue Zeit mit hinübergenommen. Frauenwelt makes the consequences of these pervasive attitudes explicit. Schreiber writes, ein Blick in die Tagespresse zeigt, wie oft auch heute noch unverheiratete Mütter zum Selbstmord, zur Vernichtung des Ungeborenen oder zum Kindesmord getrieben werden. The criticism of the treatment of unmarried mothers represents the more radical side of the political views expressed in Frauenwelt, reflecting a clear departure from the social morality of earlier times. While Frauenwelt's party political stance is most explicitly apparent in relation to motherhood in the examples of access to birth control and the rights of unmarried mothers, the magazine incorporates its political position into the mothering advice it offers more broadly and advocates the inclusion of socialist political perspectives into women's mothering practices. For example, the notion of community and collaboration is raised to encourage women to incorporate politics into the domestic sphere. The magazine's advice column, Fair Weisrat, is an example of collaborative parenting in practice. The column was launched in September 1926 as a space for readers to seek advice and exchange ideas, and it appeared regularly until 1933. The readers' questions cover topics including work, religion, financial concerns, family life, childcare, and practical advice about housework. The submitted answers would be published over the following three issues to encourage debate among the readers and a collaborative approach to resolving everyday issues. Of course, the published questions and answers were selected by the magazine editors, um, so can be presumed to represent topics and views that the SPD was prepared to endorse. Furthermore, the readers who wrote into the magazine are likely to be among the more politically engaged. Um, but nevertheless, Verweisrat provides an interesting opportunity to gain insight into the perspectives of Frauenwelt's readership. Questions submitted to Verweisrat frequently touch on political topics, as can be seen in two questions regarding appropriate stories to tell children in order to raise them in line with socialist values. The first question, submitted by a reader identified only by her initials, RL, um, in December 1926, asks, Sollen wir wirklich die alten schönen Lieder nicht mehr singen und die alten schönen Märchen nicht mehr erzählen? Similarly, the second question, submitted by LO, asks for suggestions for stories to read her two young daughters and games to play with them. She writes, Die alten Märchen vom Bauch aufschlitzen, bösen Stiefmütten, schönen Prinzen und guten Königen wollen mir für die Fantasie des Kindes nicht von Vorteil erscheinen. So these two questions approach the introduction of politics into the private sphere in a positive light. They endorse the political message of Frauenwelt by seeking to raise children who will support the socialist movement. The practical responses to these questions include information about a new volume of appropriately socialist Christmas songs, as well as socialist publications of fairy tales, a detailed list of specific authors and stories, as well as repeated suggestions that mothers could make up stories with their children. There were also calls among the answers for the development of a socialist culture, which would make it easier for families to reject religious celebrations. This suggests that more mothers would be willing to incorporate political perspectives into the private sphere if there were sufficient resources or alternatives to the existing celebrations. Yet the responses to these two questions don't actually provide a strong consensus about the best approach to storytelling with young children. This implies that unlike the authors of the question, not all readers were as willing to introduce politics into the private sphere. Indeed, the editors included a note in closing response to the first question that a full postal bag of unprinted letters remained. The volume of responses signals that, while there was no consensus reached, women felt that they possessed expertise in child raising that they were keen to share with their fellow readers. Although this is a demonstration of female solidarity, it remains rooted in traditional gender divisions of labour. 
So in addition to promoting collaboration, Frauenwelt also features a number of articles referring to the idea of Kameradschaft. For example, a 1928 article entitled Die Mutter Kameraden um, by Clara Baumschuch notes the central role that women play in the domestic sphere, but encourages them to also engage with political campaigns. The example given of a suitable campaign for mothers to support is an improvement of educational opportunities for young people. This campaign uh, corresponds to the to the priorities of the socialist movement, but it also reflects a conservative notion about women's role in society by suggesting that they will be more concerned with the protection of young people uh, than other political issues. Um, issues like taxation, foreign policy were considered more of concern for men. Indeed, throughout her article, Baumschuch promotes normative ideas about women's maternal role, alluding to idealized notions of women's nurturing and altruistic nature. She promotes women's political participation as acceptable within the limitations of pre-existing gender divisions. She suggests women's political contribution is tied to their domestic capabilities, asserting, war sie eine gute Familienmutter und Lebenskameradin ist, darum ist sie auch eine gute Staatsbürgerin, eine politische Frau. Frauenwelt encourages women to raise their children in the spirit of camaraderie and lays the responsibility for raising the next generation of socialists at women's feet. Taking a seemingly more radical approach than was typical in Frauenwelt, um, and for the time more generally, um, Judith Grunfeld writes in a 1929 article, Es ist klar, dass die Erziehung zur Kameradschaft im Elternhaus beginnen muss und dass die Gleichstellung in Bezug auf die Haushaltsarbeit heute selbstverständlich ist. So she addresses the question of camaraderie between the sexes, asserting that it's self-evident that housework should be shared between men and women. This was not self-evident at the time, and conservative ideas about gender roles were prevalent. Grunfeld's call for greater gender equality represents an example of the more feminist articles, which appeared periodically alongside articles reflecting normative ideas, um, you know, tips for housework, tips for childcare. Grunfeld cites the complaints of young socialist women who attend party meetings. She writes that these women wanted to enter into marriages in which they would be treated as equals by their partner and in which domestic responsibilities would be shared. They complain that it's unfair that their mothers do not ask their brothers to assist with housework and prioritize their brother's access to vocational and professional training. While these demands represent a feminist viewpoint, the complaints also reflect the expectation that women manage household tasks um, and hold mothers responsible for perpetuating gender inequality. Um, yeah, so they ask, wie soll denn in der Ehe dann eine Kameradschaft entstehen, wenn die Mütter die Jungen zu Egoisten auf Kosten der Mutter selbst und der Schwester erziehen? So this rhetorical question reflects the tensions present in the socialist movement and in Frauenwelt's approach to motherhood. On the one hand, there's a call to improve the status, opportunities and rights of women. But on the other hand, the expectation of women's mothering remains deeply rooted. Throughout the Weimar period and across the political spectrum, normative ideas of gender difference um, did remain incredibly widespread. Despite its support for improvement to women's rights, Frauenwelt frequently endorses these traditional ideas. Childcare, for example, was seen as exclusively women's role, and there is little evidence of expectations that men would be actively involved in raising their own children. The language of duty is frequently used in relation to women's mothering, and it is apparent from letters submitted to Verweisrat that the notion of maternal duty was widely held among the readership. To illustrate this, um, let's look at a question submitted in 1926 by an anonymous reader whose husband was a party and union functionary. The reader asks how her husband's political activities can be reconciled with protecting family life, which she claims suffers through his frequent absences. This question already reveals the gender division of labor so prevalent in the Weimar period with the husband engaging in work and politics in the public sphere while the wife is focused on the private sphere. 
The question also um, corresponds to the idea that was integral to the founding aims of Frauenwelt, um, that is that male political activity contrasted with female political naivety or passivity. The responses submitted to this question do little to challenge these assumptions. Women's maternal role is emphasized, for example, by one Frau Maria A, who writes, da ist es Sache der Mutter das Kind zu erziehen. Um, well, E.W. believes, darunter leidet das Familienleben nicht allzu sehr und die Kindererziehung ist bei der Frau in guten Händen. Several responses also invoke the language of sacrifice to argue that it is women's lot to look after the household while their husbands are out engaging in political work. These responses highlight the continued acceptance of the existence of gendered spheres and maternalist notions that women should play a supportive role in society. The exclusivity of women's caring role is underlined in Anna Ziemsen's 1924 article, Unsere Kinder. Appealing to the readership's assumed collective experiences of mothering, she writes, Wir sind in den ersten Lebensjahren des Kindes so gut wie allein die Hüte Pflege erzieher. In contrast to the reader's responses, which do acknowledge the challenges associated with motherhood through their references to sacrifice, Ziemsen employs a quasi-religious language to frame motherhood as an honor or a higher calling. She identifies mothers as responsible for guiding their children. Um, she writes, wir Mütter sind den Kindern als erster Führer gegeben in seiner in einer sehr verworrenen Welt. Zinsen takes women's mothering as self-evident and invokes the idea of maternal instinct when she writes, Gewiss wird eine richtige Mutter zu ihren eigenen Kindern von vornherein Beziehungen des Verständnisses und der Liebe haben, die ein Fremde schwer oder nie hat. So her reference to a richtige Mutter hints at idealized notions of motherhood and further entrenches um, expectations of women's primary role within the domestic sphere. Um, Simpson is not alone in referencing um, these biologically essentialist ideas. To cite just one of many more examples, um, Henny Schumacher, a kindergarten teacher, journalist, and like Tony Zender, a former member of the USPD, wrote in 1925, um, dass jede gesunde Frau zur Mutterschaft drängt, ist Tatsache. In ihr lebt die Sehnsucht nach dem Kinder. This highlights how deeply ingrained the idea of maternal instinct was. Um, and the idea that the desire to mother comes from within women firmly roots this as a biological rather than socially constructed phenomenon. Yet, while women's desire to mother and primary responsibility for childcare is assumed, the ways in which they mother was open to discussion and Frauenwelt hope to exert influence over women's mothering by positioning itself as an authority on modern socialist mothering practices. In fact, in her article, Unsere Kinder, Ziemsen argues that women's maternal instinct exists, but instinct alone is insufficient. She proposes that women should be educated about childcare, citing particularly the need for women to receive training in nutrition, sleep and infant bathing. She warns that women could, despite their best intentions, inadvertently harm their children if they're not equipped with appropriate up-to-date knowledge. Sharing such practical advice is one way in which Frauenwelt seeks to position itself as an authority. Um, so throughout its period of publication, Frauenwelt frequently published practical information um, addressing common issues that it thought that mothers may face. So two 1926 articles by Edith Rosenkrantz deal with infant care. Um, in the first, which appeared as, a as part of a series of articles entitled Die Kunst des Gesundseins, Rosenkrantz advises readers about how to keep their newborn babies clean. And in the second article, uh, published the following month, she offers advice with diet and nutrition. Um, such as how often to breastfeed a newborn baby, when to begin weaning, and she includes a sample meal plan for a one-year-old. While the idea that women possess special natural caring capacities remained widespread, there was also acknowledgement that they did not necessarily have the knowledge or access to developments in childcare theory um, to care for and raise children in the way that Frauenwelt advocates. 
By suggesting that childcare requires education, the argument that such work should be the exclusive responsibility of women is undermined. Such articles thus exemplify the tensions between um, these biologically essentialist, but also um, more progressive ideas. A further way in which Frauenbelt seeks to signal its authority is by indicating the expertise of those offering the advice. Um, so academic titles or medical titles are included. Um, so at uh, Universitäts, Professor Dr. Anna Simson, uh, Dr. Edith Rosenkranz, Schwester Lotte Müller, um, information about the titles and professions of the contributors lends the notion of credibility and validity to their articles and signals to the readers that the advice can be trusted. Moreover, the magazine drew on and signaled expertise gained through personal experience, as can be seen in Hannah Langer's 1930 article, Behüten oder Abhärten. Langer describes how she accustomed her baby to fresh air and cooler temperatures and declares as evidence of the merits of this approach, niemals ist das Kind erkältet gewesen. The sharing of lived experiences enhances the authenticity of the articles and adds weight to the advice by demonstrating that it has already been put into practice successfully. Um, Fraunwelt also drew on the expertise of its own readership via the advice column, Wer weiß Rat. The column builds on historical practices of women sharing mothering advice, um, historically between generations. The volume of responses submitted to the questions in this column shows that women consider themselves to be experts in matters required, uh, relating to child raising. Although Wer Weisrat was founded on the premise of the readers sharing their personal expertise, the editors of Frauenwelt curated the published answers. Um, for example, the management of children's bad behaviour was a recurring topic, and between 1926 and 1928, three readers explicitly sought advice from their contemporaries about dealing with their children's aggressive behaviour. One answer, submitted by a reader identified as IT, proposed that giving a misbehaving toddler a slap on the back of the hand to demonstrate that this hurts and it's therefore bad behavior should be sufficient to prevent a child from hitting others. A short note from the editors follows IT's recommendation. They write, wir möchten betonen, dass die Erziehung des Kleinkindes doch schwieriger ist, als es der Einzentren wohl erscheint. The editor's intervention undermines IT and creates a hierarchy between the advice sent in by readers and that published in the rest of the magazine. Um, I've discussed the patronizing assumption of women's political naivety upon which Frauenwelt was founded, and the magazine's positioning of itself as an authority reflects the expectation that women required educating. We can see, however, from the questions submitted to Wer Weisrat, that women did actively seek advice as well, and they were willing to incorporate new practices into their mothering. Uh, for example, in the discussions of children's bad behaviour, one questioner, ER, emphasises that she doesn't want to resort to hitting her son, revealing changing attitudes towards corporal punishment. Indeed, almost all of the printed responses to these questions stress that mothers should react to their children's behaviour with patience and care. These responses demonstrate women's rejection of previous models of parenting, but also reiterate an idealised notion of a mother as patient, loving, caring. Um, in seeking new models of mothering, Frauenwelt turns to psychoanalysis, as a theoretical foundation for modern parenting practices, which take into account emerging ideas about psychological development. Psychoanalysis grabbed the public imagination in the early 20th century and reached a wide amateur as well as professional audience during the Weimar era. This is evidenced in a number of responses to the questions from readers asking about advice for their children's aggressive behavior. Two respondents, for example, is the mother of a teenager who's exhibited violent behaviour to take her son to see a psychiatrist. While this advice demonstrates the reader's familiarity with emerging psychological theories, it also reveals a further tension in the socialist movement. No suggestion is made about how a working class mother with limited time or financial means should act on and implement this idea. Psychoanalytic theory 
was presented as a modern approach to mothering, but was still deeply rooted in gender essentialism. Criticisms of Freud's theories of psychoanalysis have been widely discussed, um, and I'm not going to expand here on the male bias in those theories, but I will highlight that Frauenwelt disseminated these biologically essentialist ideas um, without engaging in any kind of critical evaluation of the theory. By presenting idealised notions of women's inherent mothering capacities, Frauenwelt formed part of the mechanism which reproduces women as mothers. This process is described in detail in Nancy Chodorow's seminal 1978 study, The Reproduction of Mothering. Chodorow builds on early Freudian psychoanalysis to argue that the fact that women mother and are almost exclusively responsible for childcare impacts on gendered personality development, creates the expectation of women's mothering and develops in women the desire to mother. Chodorow's theory, which reframes Freudian psychoanalysis, offers an explanation for Frauenwelt's readership's apparent acceptance of women's mothering as self-evident and the promotion of conservative notions of gender throughout the magazine, as well as in society more widely. Reading Frauenwelt in the context of developments in psychoanalytic theory helps to contextualize the tensions between um, on the one hand, calls for innovations in parenting and modernization of social structures, but on the other hand, retaining the concept of women's exclusive mothering. Chodorow's text was published over 40 years after the end of the Weimar period. Um, and as I mentioned, much of the psychoanalysis produced by the Freudian school during the Weimar era was strongly rooted in notions of inherent gender difference um, and usually by implication male superiority. There are, however, some examples of feminist theories of women's psychology emerging during the Weimar era. One such example, which challenges the biological basis for women's mothering and anticipates Chodorow's later work, is Alice Rühle Gerstel's Das Frauenproblem der Gegenwart, published in 1932. Rühle Gerstel belonged to the Marxist individual psychology school of thought based on a left-wing interpretation of Alfred Adler's theory of individual psychology. Like Chodorow, Rula Gerstel challenges the notion of inherent gender difference and emphasizes the impact of girls' socialization on their personality development. Drawing on Adler's theory, which argues that feelings of inferiority motivate human behavior, um, leading individuals to strive for a goal of superiority, um, to compensate for their perceived inferiority, um, Rula Gerstel suggests that women's feelings of inferiority are compounded by the prevailing gender hierarchy. Um, she argues that women internalize social perceptions of their own inferiority and their attempts to compensate are therefore narrower in comparison to men's. So she argues women strive towards more limited goals. Women thus become unknowingly complicit in perpetuating gender inequality. This offers a further way in which to read the acceptance and promotion of women's primary role in the domestic sphere as presented in Frauenwelt. Rula Gerstel's personal political convictions were somewhat further to the left than the social democratic politics of Frauenwelt, and she was never featured in the magazine herself. Um, but her ideas do help to uncover the wider left-wing debates around women's role in society within which the discussions in Frauenwelt were situated. Uh, while Rula Gerstel's work doesn't appear, Alfred Adler's theory of individual psychology is referenced in Frauenwelt to support mothering advice given. Among the responses to a Verweisrat question about managing behavior is a letter from Dr. Julian Marcuse, a psychologist and regular contributor to Frauenwelt. The letter directs the questioner towards Adler's theory, suggesting that the questioner's son is suffering from feelings of inferiority. Adler's theory is cited again in a 1927 article by Erika Fonte entitled Erziehungsberatungsstellen. She underlines the important influence of childhood experiences on adult life, a central tenet of psychoanalytic theories, and quotes the idea of feelings of inferiority as being central to psychological development. Um, the inclusion of references to advances in psychoanalysis, um, technical terminology and articles written in this kind of quasi-scientific language forms part of the magazine's strategy of positioning itself as an authority. 
A series of articles written by Professor Dr. Bega describe childhood development, tackling topics such as speech acquisition or children's difficulty in sitting still. Um, and he does so in biological and psychological terms. Um, so he writes, Denn wie wir heute wissen, bildet der stark ausgebildete Bewegungsdrang der Kinder die biologische Grundlage für ihr geistiges und körperliches Wachstum. So Bega alludes to new research, indicating the need for mothers to update their practices based on emerging information and his use of quasi-technical terms such as biologisch or geistig contribute to the presentation of authority. The endorsement of theories which offer biologically based explanations for psychological and personality development meant that there was severely limited space in Frauenwelt for debates and exploration of feminist theories which challenged assumptions of women's mothering. As we've seen, despite support for improved rights for mothers and modeling of modern socialist mothering, the presentation of motherhood in Frauenwelt remained deeply rooted in essentialist and conservative ideas. Um, reflecting a wider idealization of women's mothering across the political spectrum in Weimar, Germany. Um, so to conclude, um, what has an analysis of the presentation and discussion of motherhood in Frauenwelt revealed about the socialist movement and the idealization of motherhood? The idealization of women's mothering role, supported by biologically essentialist psychoanalytic ideas, cemented gender divisions of labor and the patronizing attitudes of the SPD leadership, which repeatedly cast women in a supporting role. Women were included in the socialist movement as those responsible for raising the next generation of socialists and nurturing the well being of the community. As we've seen, this role was accepted by many left-wing women who willingly and proudly fulfilled their perceived duty. Yet this conservative approach to gender roles existed in parallel with more politically radical ideas, which sought to give women greater control over their reproductive choices and to improve the rights of unmarried mothers and their children who continued to experience discrimination in the Weimar era. Um, the socialist approach to motherhood can therefore be defined by tensions and contradictions. On the one hand, support for socially progressive policies to improve women's reproductive rights and choices, and on the other, the continued promotion of women's maternal duty. The insights gained from Frauenwelt help us develop a more nuanced understanding of women's experiences and attitudes during the Weimar period. For example, the prevalent image of the independent, childless new woman reflected neither the lived reality nor the aspirations of many young women during this period. The existence and widespread acceptance of the expectation of women's mothering contributed to the continued gender inequality despite the constitutional declaration of men and women's equal rights and responsibilities in 1919. These insights into the gender politics of the socialist movement during the Weimar period helped to broaden our knowledge of the context within which the far right emerged in the late Weimar era. Um, of course, with the advantage of hindsight, we can ask whether the firmly rooted left-wing normalization of ideas about gender difference and the ongoing idealization of women's mothering left left-wing women poorly equipped to challenge effectively the emergence of the deeply misogynistic fascist policies. While the Weimar era has received, and as we enter the centenary period, continues to receive scholarly attention, there do remain unanswered questions about how women engage with the competing discourses around their changing social role, the continuity of expectations of gender divisions of labor, and the presentation of women's mothering as self-evident. Uncovering and examining women's voices in these debates enables us to deepen our knowledge of this period which played a significant role in shaping 20th century European history. It helps us to understand and challenge continued assumptions of and attempts at both a personal and state level to control women's mothering throughout the 20th century and even into the 21st century. Um, thank you very much for listening. Yes, well, thank you so much. And I think, yes, you you, you are owed a big clap for this. <laughs> please, please, you know, even if you're muted, I, I do think we ought to thank Catherine properly for this. Uh, it, it was a brilliant talk. And I, I as you say, 
uh, if you look a little bit deeper into not only the content, but also the way these arguments are constructed and the way authority is claimed, um, you can really reveal quite a lot of tensions and that, you know, the issues are much, much less simple than, um, than, than you think. So, so thank you very much for showing this so very clearly. Um, if you have questions, and I'm sure there are lots of questions, please indicate that in the chat and I'll pick those, those questions up and, um, uh, and feed them through. I'd quite like to, to start off um, by further complicating the issue, really. Um, because what, what I was thinking about, so you, you spoke um, in your first part, you spoke a lot about the reproductive choices um, uh, of women. And when you, when you did that, uh, your focus was very much on the right uh, not to have children, not to be a mother. Uh, and um, I'm thinking of, um, uh, you know, the line of argument that went the other way, um, which you had very much in uh, the proponents of the, um, the Bund für Mutterschutz and, uh, you know, who wrote in the, in the journal Die Neue Generation, where the tag is exactly the opposite. And, uh, I mean, they, they were, if anything, way more left-wing than, than, than the women uh, who wrote in the Frauenwelt. And they were, um, uh, so, so they, they, their main arguments were um, women should have the right to be mothers outside marriage, because what is ma marriage is completely obsolete. It, it stops women to be mothers when they want to be. Um, so that was the first thing. And the second thing, of course, Women should be able to be mothers and fulfill their place, you know, in, in a political or in a, in, a, in a public forum. So this was mainly aimed at this um, at the celibacy of uh, uh, of teachers. So the idea that you know, uh, you know, they were really fighting very strongly for for uh, uh, getting rid of of that law, which I think was was um, repealed briefly for a couple of years at the beginning of the Weimar Republic but then reinstated in 1923. So teachers couldn't have children. Um, and they were very strongly, very clearly aligned with the socialist movement. Um, of course, you know, not, not really in a, uh, in a sort of accepted party political line, but uh, they would have definitely termed themselves socialist. They would have termed themselves feminist. Um, they're not at all traditional. Um, and I think they really sort of, burst this whole idea of categories of you know what is traditional what is feminist but it, it all kind of seems to fall apart what, what do you do with that Catherine yeah I mean there was a couple of things I was going to comment on um firstly the kind of the splintering of the women's movements in Weimar Germany and as you say the the goals of the Mutterschutzbewegung um overlapped substantially with those of the left wing um but they didn't substantially collaborate, um, which, you know, looking back on it, it seems like a bit of a historical frustration that, you know, what could they have achieved had they collaborated more? Um, but yes, yeah, something that I didn't go into in the lecture and actually wasn't a particularly prominent theme in Frauenwelt was the campaigns for things like um, paid maternity leave for women. Um, so, you know, the, the protections for women, I think was it six weeks before and after a birth and that you should be paid um, I think it's seventy five percent of your normal salary during that time. So there, yeah, there absolutely were campaigns to enable women to um, become mothers, um, but that wasn't actually um, substantially thematized in Frauenwelt. Um, I think because of this assumption that that women were on board with that anyway, and maybe didn't need persuading in the same way that their their arguments in favour of access to abortion were perhaps a more contentious issue, so required more persuasion. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it, it just complicates this whole idea yeah. of um, wanting to be a mother is a traditional thing, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was it was taken as um, it was taken as red. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, so we have a question, Caroline. Caroline Bland, um, do you want to ask your question, please? Caroline? Yes, sorry. I feel, I feel um, 
I'm abusing my position here as supervisor, but I'm not a plant. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Um, I just wanted you to, if you could, just just broaden this out for a minute, because some people who are familiar with the earlier part of the women's movement might be thinking, hang on, um, Clara, Zedkin, die Gleichheit, what's happened to that hard political edge? Why have we sort of gone off in the direction of, of something that is more like a women's magazine? And is this something to do with the SPD trying to broaden its membership again or trying to get more um, female members or what's going on here and what happened to the, the, the harder political or the, you know, the more politically focused discourse with, within the socialist women's movement? Um, yeah. So, I mean, um, so Maria Yukach, um was, I think, considered less radical than Clara Zetkin. She took over after Clara Zetkin um, went and um, joined the newly founded Communist Party. Um, so in general, her approach was less confrontational. Mm -hmm. um, she she kind of, she didn't challenge the separation of women's issues and the rest of the party's issues. Um, yeah, the women's magazine was intended, so they said it was aimed at um, women, socialist women, but I think it was also trying to um, encourage more political engagement from perhaps the wives or um, female relations of men who are in the party. Um, there was a second women's magazine that was founded by the SPD shortly afterwards called Die Genossen um, in response to the complaints from the more politically engaged um, women members that Frauenwelt was just too superficial. Um, Die Genossin was very dry, though. It was mostly just made up of reports of party meetings or updates on new policies. Um, so it really wasn't aimed at a, a general audience like Frauenwelt was. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how successful Frauenwelt was in attracting new women to the party. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. It was it was founded with that idea that it would make the movement more appealing to women who perhaps hadn't voted before or weren't accustomed to voting. Mm. And can I just ask one little follow-up question? Because obviously we've discussed this publication before, but I hadn't actually seen those title pages uh, until today. So it's really nice to see those. Um, and, and lots of them had women with children how, have you just picked those out or is this a very uh, that was that very typical or you, what other sorts of illustrations did they have on the front um, yeah that was reasonably typical there are also a lot with quite bland just kind of pictures of flowers and vases and you know okay. quite nondescript images there was also interestingly quite a lot um with kind of quite idealized countryside imagery you know people working on farms um so I think it kind of, you know, alluding to an idealised, okay. simpler life, maybe. Um, yeah, there wasn't, it wasn't particularly modernist. There weren't a lot of city images or um, anything like that. And there also weren't a lot of kind of realistic pictures of hardship or anything. They were all, um, they were all quite um, kind of, yeah, a bit idealised, kind of mm. soft, like appealing. They, mm. Yeah. It meant okay. to be attractive. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. So uh, we, we've got lots of questions coming in here, but I, I'll I'll just uh, pick up the question a question that relates to the journal Die Frauenwelt as we were talking about this right now. Um, Rory, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Yes. Hi. Hiya. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for a fascinating talk. Um, some of the some of this question you might just have answered um i was just wondering how much we yeah how much we know about the actual readership of frauenwelt um you have alluded to the readers a, a couple of times i think in in your, your your talk yeah how do do we have figures on how many how many copies were sold or where they were sold who was reading it? Why they were reading it? Was there any um, was there any sense of, of of readers reading it maybe for purposes which 
those who published Frauenwelt hadn't quite foreseen, and um, and also to what extent was um, Frauenwelt kind of competing for readers with other women or socialist uh, publications? Um, yeah, there are circulation figures. I don't have them off the top of my head, but they are out there. Um, it didn't have a massive circulation. Um, in terms of competing for readers, it, it does, if you compare um, Frauenwelt to something like Vorwärts or um, Die Gleichheit, which came before, it looks strikingly different. It looks much more like a magazine than a newspaper. It's full of pictures. Um, it's not got that kind of, you know, the text isn't tiny and, you know, covers the entire page. It It is a much more, I mean, it is a much more attractive publication to look at. Um, so I think it probably wasn't actually competing in quite the same market as those other um, newspapers or other left-wing publications. Um, I know there was a similar short-lived magazine um, called Der Weg der Frau, which was um, run more by communists rather than social democratic women that did have a similar kind of look. It was more this kind of magazine style publication. Um, and then the readership itself you asked about as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of, um, if you look at the letters sent into Verweisrat and what they reveal about themselves, um, a lot of married women, not all of them working, um, yeah, mostly um, the questions are preoccupied with quite domestic topics. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, yeah. Um, I, I, I think it, it, I was sort of also wa wondering about the extent to which, yeah, they, they, they were reaching readers who were not necessarily the same women who would be reading kind of lots of other socialist publications or going to socialist meetings. But it sounds from what you say in, 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 in terms of the preoccupations that came, that, that came up in a lot of the letters that they were to some extent successful or they might have been successful in 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 gaining a readership slightly beyond a kind of quite narrow political circle yeah i think they were i think they were reaching a different readership to the you know the actual um you know women who'd be local representatives so yeah i don't think it was a complete failure as a magazine <laughs> right. thank you Okay, thank you. That's great. And we can um, follow up with a question that fits right in there. Uh, Adia, can you ask it? Hello, good evening. Hi. Um, yeah, a very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And my question pertains to um, uh, your research. Uh, so are you looking at women as a heterogeneous group? Because uh, you also talked about uh, working women in particular, not um, like facing constraints in following the advice given in the Frau and Well. So, and are you looking at how different classes of women um, had their uh, lives uh, affected by the uh, kind of uh, policies or, or the kind of atmosphere that Weimar had at that time. So are you looking at women as a heterogeneous group also here? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so actually um, most of the texts I'm looking at in my thesis um, are written by and generally aimed at um, left-wing women. Um, I've so when I initially started, I was looking at popular fiction texts, but I found that um, actually the the tensions um, that come out in the left wing fiction and nonfiction um, is really interesting, and um, I've ended up looking much more into into how um, those kind of debates were framed um, in terms of you know, wanting to promote these more progressive ideas, but still doing so, um, you know, rooted in, in much more essentialist ideas. So no, I'm not, um, I'm not aiming to kind of look at all women in Weimar Germany or make, um, make claims about 
um, all women's attitudes. My, my focus is much more on um, more politically engaged left wing women. Um, that seems to be a good moment for Francesco to come in and ask his question. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me and see? Okay, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for a very insightful and inspiring talk. And I was just thinking about um, also the, um, the movement for lesbian emancipation and also sexological debates around notions of third sex, uh, which were very much present during the Weimar Republic and which were also at times uh, supported by um, socialist parties such as yesterday. And I was wondering what kind of role did these other movements play in, in, in these debates and whether there were any instances of friction or collaboration with the, if we could call it like that, the, the heterosexual women's um, rights movement, or whether whether you found any references to these debates um, in Frauenwelt, for example. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting question, actually. Um, it's not something that really comes up in Frauenwelt. It is something that is touched on in some of the more um, radical um, psychological books I've been looking at. So um, Rula Gerstel does touch on questions of sexuality um, in a way that not so much in something like Frauenwelt. Um, it's not a kind of main focus of my, my thesis um, because I'm mostly looking at women um, and their, their relationship with motherhood. So it is by default um, generally women in heterosexual relationships. Um, but no, that is something that comes up. And I think it's quite interesting how... Um, how some of that's framed in the psychoanalytic texts. Um, there's also Sophia Lazarsfeld. I've looked at a little bit of her work. Um, she was another individual psychologist, so she she does engage with that. So that yeah, you're right. There is engagement with that topic, um, but in the texts I've been looking at, not so much in the more mainstream ones. But yeah, thank you. That's a really interesting question. Okay, now we have a question uh, on um, the influence, really, and, and how, how things um, developed um, later on. So, Matthew, could you ask your question, please? Hi, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, that was a great talk, Catherine. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I wonder, you may not know anything about this, but I wondered if you knew anything about the continuation in, of those themes into the time of the GDR, and uh, because you know, the Gleichberechtigung der Frau and the protection of women's, women, women's working opportunities and their careers was hugely important in the GDR. And I wondered particularly whether you knew whether that was motivated and informed by economic questions or whether it was um, similarly based on sort of biological determinism as, as you've identified that what happened in the, the um, Frauenwelt was. Um, honestly, I don't know. Um, but that's all right. Thank you for the question. Um, no, I mean, you're right. These themes definitely continued and, you know, paragraph 218 um, continued in various forms in both East and West Germany throughout most of the 20th century. And that, you know, that was a topic. Um, and women in East Germany did have um, more liberal access to, to birth control or abortion than women in the West. Um, so, yeah, no, you're absolutely right that those themes continued. Um, in terms of the motivation, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I think it, I think both explanations would be plausible. And, um, yeah, yeah, I had, um, because... Um, I was doing some work on a project which never went anywhere, which was about uh, photographically illustrated children's books. And uh, I found some fabulous things from what was East Germany. And next to all this banner waving stuff about, you know, being committed socialists, there was sort of knitting patterns and, uh, and, uh, and, and kids and, and which, which uh, I guess, 
I did. I never lived there, but it, that seems sort of slightly out of out of step with the idea of being a heroic socialism socialist. And it reminded me a bit of. And I thought of that when you were talking about some of the sort of. I don't know for want of a better better phrase, the recipe sections that might have been in in Frauenville. and but I know that um, similar um, questions were raised about the the fe British feminist magazine Spare Rib in in the nineteen seventies that they, it was kind of dismissed as it shouldn't have sort of sewing patterns and recipes in it. So that sounds really interesting. That. Um... But I guess, I guess I guess that's just the start of another range of questions and another <laughs> debate, not, not one that we can answer at this moment. And um, it was a fabulous talk and they're really, really great. Yeah, I think that sounds really interesting. And it does feel weird when you're looking through Fraunveld that, you know, you, the front you have the more politically motivated articles, then you turn the page and there's a pattern for making a dress according to the latest fashions. It, it does feel a little bit um, disjointed at times. Um, I, it it seems to me... I, I think Frauenberg really is, is a great, you know, treasure trove of, um, uh, of material, and you've, you've, you've selected really interesting material there. Is there any way of um, determining to what extent the party leadership was exerting influence? I mean, is there? Did you find articles by the same women in other outlets where maybe they sound a little bit different. I mean, is there anything you can say about that? Yeah, there, there were some people writing who were also writing for four vets or writing, um, writing for the other socialist publications. Um, not all of the women, the articles were by women either. There were, um, there were articles by socialist men, um, some reprints as well from other publications. Um, I think the party leadership was kind of involved from a distance. In um, in Tony Zender's autobiography, when she talks about how she ended up becoming editor, um, she was approached by members of the party leadership um, who asked her to take on the editorship. So they were involved in who was who was controlling the magazine. But then she said one of her conditions for taking on the editorship was that it would be under her control because um, she was aware that she was a little more to the left of the party than, than some other members. Um, so one of her conditions was you won't interfere and I can publish what I like in it. Um, so so there, was, there was party engagement, but, um, you know, it's, it's slightly removed, a little bit of a distance. I think it was seen as, you know, kind of the woman's thing. And, um, yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much again, Catherine. Really, it thank was you. A very very good talk and uh, very much enjoyed i think there's lots lots i want to follow up after this so um we have no further questions so uh i'll just thank you from from all of us oh, thank you have a great second day tomorrow um and yes <laughs> okay bye bye everyone thank you and thank you